This then in turn allows us to work with a lesser staff on the weekend. Uh -huh. Now it has been broken and uh, it's been broken so for the past since May it's a question they decide they should put the money in. Uh -huh. And because it's politics, it's election time coming Oh up, yeah. Now the question is nobody wants to spend the money to repair. It's about sixty-five thousand dollars, give or take ten. Mm -hmm. But nobody wants to commit themselves to it. So therefore, now we're feeling the pinch of it that it's broken because we're short on the weekends. Yeah. It's a union house Ooh. and you know, uh, they watch the clock. Work it takes them 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes to run down and wash their hands so they can't punch out. <laughs> and the result is uh, we, have, we have problems that everything has to be prepared from scratch. Uh -huh. And cooperation between shifts in a union house, if properly run, is good. But here, our employees are politically picked. Uh, God, you guess. And that presents a problem. So we're doing good. We're doing good compared to that. We have the cleanest since I took over the kitchen. Forgive me for using the word I. We have passed eight state inspections in a row where before that was not possible. The last one we passed, dietary passed with, with a, not even one deficiency. Excellent. That is unusual. Well, that army training helped. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to whip them into shape. Uh, uh, well, we could do a little bit better, but it's a different when you got union workers. Yeah, I know. I'm not against union because I've been on the side of the union, too. I know. Too. It's, it's <laughs> I've tough. I've been on both sides. Okay, what I'm going to do first is make a brief statement for the camera, and then we'll, uh, we'll get into it. Right. Okay? You ready? Oh, we're interviewing Mr. Mario A. Casella. Casella? Yes. Uh, at uh, Saratoga Armory. It is July 30th, 19, or excuse me, 2001. Michael Akey, interviewer. Wayne Clark, videographer. Mr. Casella, where were you born? I was born in uh, what is a town called a Jettle, but it's really near. Positano, which is a province of Naples, Italy, okay. in 1923, October the 19th. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, uh, and the fun part is that I was, while I was born in Italy, I was really born as an American citizen. My father served in the First World War, and at that time, those that served honorably, every immigrant that came to this country. Up until 1923, any children born to him and to his wife, at the end of the honorable discharge, they automatically became American citizens. Mm -hmm. So did the children. So even though I was born in Italy, the only one in my family, I was born as an American citizen in Europe. And I missed that by one month. Had I been born in November, that would not apply. The law was changed in 1923, November, that even though the parents were American citizens, mm -hmm. if you were born in any foreign country, you would have had to apply the normal procedure of citizenship for waiting for five years. Well, I missed it by one month. So you started, your life started uh, lucky right at this right, beginning. Right there and then. And uh, when did you come over to the States? I came over, my dad had been back and forth several times. He came over in 1927. Uh, he came, he was here before, he went back and forth. He was there in 1923 when I was born. Then he came back here. He would stay here a few years. Then he would go back, and like every Italian or every immigrant at that time, the dream was to return home with American money and live a, con a life of comfort and ease. Mm -hmm. Well, in this situation, it didn't work out that way. 
what happened is he came back in 1927 and he decided to go back in 1929, uh, give or take close to 1930. And uh, I was at that time about seven years old, six, seven years old. So he went to Europe. And at that time, Mussolini had issued an edict that every American citizen, he'd had to give up his citizenship and become an Italian, or usually everything would be confiscated and they would be allowed to leave. He was told that night by what they call one of the police carbonators or brisaliera, they are variation of Italian police, that he was going to be arrested in the morning because he was not going to give up his American citizenship. So he traveled to the American Council in Naples during the night and he told them what was happening. So the American Council stepped in and he said, <clears throat> whatever you do, you can confiscate him, but you cannot arrest him. And him and his family had to leave. So he was allowed to take $500 with him. And he came back to this country. At that time it was, I believe, 1931, 1932, mm -hmm. in that period of time. Right in the middle of the Depression. Right at the beginning of the Depression he hit it. And uh, he worked for his brothers a few times. Then, of course, he uh, managed to put together enough money where he eventually bought his own place. And he stayed in that one spot until he retired and gave up and decided that it was time to maybe collect his Social Security at age 72. What kind of business was he in? Mostly, uh, at that time, most of the, uh, the Italians, especially his brothers, were in the food business. Mm -hmm. His was a small grocery shop with uh, some hot sandwiches, which my mother would do to cook, and, and vegetables. Mm -hmm. Later on, as the neighborhood changed over, he decided to go strictly vegetables and very little groceries. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, I, as I left school and I went to, to help him in the business, we would, became mostly a vegetable store, nothing. We would sell fresh produce mm -hmm. daily from the market and uh, very little on the groceries part. We kept a few Italian products. Where'd you go to school? I went to PS 125 elementary school. Then I went to junior high 43. Which was in, where? In New York City. Uh, PS 125 was located on 25th Street. Uh, junior high for high school 43. Uh, that was at 130th Street. Then I dropped out of there because everybody <coughs> was required, whether male or female, you have to help the family. purpose of bringing large families into the world was to help the family survive and was a tradition carried over from Europe. However, my parents, I was lucky again, believed in educated, me and my brother. So my brother stayed on to finish high school normally. I went to George Washington uh, High School all the way up uh, on Washington Street. After I would help my father and at five o'clock I would leave, take the subway, walk all the way, walk up that hill in George Washington High School and I finished my high school degree just in time to be drafted at 43 and report in February the 4th, 1944 to Camp Upton, Long Island. So you, uh, you were able to graduate? Yes, I managed to graduate the high school. And off to Camp Upton? Uh, and off to Camp Upton. That was the same place where my uh, dad served and his, did his basic in World War One, it was unusual, but now it was completely different. That became sort of a reception center where they would collect people and then they would redistribute for training or where you test it out. What was Camp Upton like in 43? In, uh, in 
you mean? When, when you were there, what was Camp Upton like? Oh, Camp Upton, it was barracks, rough. They were putting them up as fast as they could. Mm -hmm. uh, I was very uh, wooden barracks, same as you would see in every other camp. Mm -hmm. But it was the first time I expected to see tents like you would see in the old movies. Mm -hmm. When I arrived there, and then we arrived there at night, and it was raining, so they put up in these barracks in the morning, and they gave us our uniforms, normal shots, indoctrination, with lectures, so forth. Mm -hmm. And then we got our first taste of what is known as good old KP, or doing chores, and uh, I was assigned to cleaning up an officer's club, me and two other people. Mm -hmm. Well, officer's club at that time were not at all like the officer's club of today, or later on at the end of the war. This officer's club was also made out of wood and put up. But it was a hell of a lot better compared to what we had. Uh, but we didn't stay at Camp Upton. I stayed there about a week. Mm -hmm. and then I was shipped from there to... Uh, Camp Croft, South Carolina. That's where we did our base. Okay, what was, uh, let's see, you're an Italian boy from New York and South Carolina. What was that like? Well, I was lucky because uh, there seemed to be a large group. At that time, you, you, would eat, you had a choice, Navy or the infantry. Of course, if you didn't choose the Navy, you went <laughs> infantry. So there were quite a few New York boys okay. down at Camp Up Upton in my unit. And uh, I was amazed how many, there were a few from, uh, from Pennsylvania, Jersey, we had quite a few. But in my barracks, the majority was mostly all New Yorks from the surrounding areas, uh, mm -hmm. the Bronx, Manhattan, Queens, Staten Island, and uh, Westchester is a bit from the other counties, I remember that. And we kept pretty busy over there because the base at that time was unbelievable. Uh, but compared to the, the armies or the dope boys or World War I, it was heaven. Really? It was unbelievable. The food was a tremendous improvement. We're in our mess halls, the dining halls as they are called today, we ate one squadron, uh, we'd eat to a table, six men on each side. Mm -hmm. One was taken to be, uh, to be the, the server, he would go up and get the food. Then later on, at times on the weekend, we would go through the line, each one with a stainless steel tray, they would serve us at the line, you mm -hmm. would take what you, what you felt like. But even at that time, there was a question of, uh, if you did take a, a question of waste, we don't waste food. So anything that you took, you were required to eat. Mm -hmm. Today, I understand, and from what I'm familiar today, in the new uh, army, you have a choice of hamburgers or french fries, you have your sodas, you have, not while you're in basic, uh, but as you come out of basic, you eat more like a family type situation, four to a table, mm -hmm. or possibly more of a round table discussion. And that's also a little bit much nice today. And the Army today has changed a great deal. And uh, it is the people today, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity compared to what we first went in. But then, you got to realize too, in a situation where all of a sudden we put together something like 17, 19 million men in all the, in all the services, uh, compared to the European armies, we were the envy of the world. To the Americans, to many American boys and to myself, we were exposed to a heck of a lot of new foods, mm -hmm. and it was good food. Mm -hmm. I mean, compared to the menu that I would eat at home, compared to the menu in the service, well, where do you get meat almost every day? <laughs> you know, it, it didn't happen, so. That was, uh, 
there was a change that I liked. The KP, uh, <coughs> the KP, uh, everybody got their fair share, but nobody complained about it. There were a few people who did not like the army, but it was different. It was an army that, uh, that was put together. I, I understand it a lot better now. It was an army that I don't think it ever existed like it existed before in the world. We, we had the boys uh, that you could say not only from New York City, but it was an army that you had a kid from the West, you had a kid from, uh, from the farms, the dairy farms, you had a kid from the South, you had a kid, uh, you know, as we used to call them, name them from whatever kid, the, the, the Indians and so forth. It was an army that wasn't built to go out and conquer lands. It was an army that, that was supposed to create freedom. And while the Germans made us look as if we were the great beast that was coming to devour them, and I know my division, like the 69th Infantry, they called us the American SS because the 6th and the 9th looked like two S's. But it wasn't that. It was an army that was built really to bring more freedom and everything and friendliness on it. Mm -hmm. it it showed and it built a camaraderie that it existed, which it does exist today once the those army units. But at that time, to take all these billions of people and put them together as a group, I'm sure it can be done today. But at that time, with a lack of officers and non commissioned officers, mm -hmm. it was incredible to put together an army so large in which our only desire was to free and bring freedom to other people mm -hmm. and not to conquer them. The only thing we did ask of them was a small piece of land where we could bury our dead, if you come down to it. It wasn't something that we want, we're going to keep or we're going to teach you or we're, we're going to tell you how you should live. We didn't do that. Mm -hmm. We had military governments, but it wasn't for that. But it was also where you found the, where if the white pilots were flying the American bombers over Germany or Japan, you also had the black fire pilots right. fly the, the flying cover for them. It was something that was thrown together. It was a group of men and women which really figured they had a heart was in it to win mm -hmm. and to recreate and bring freedom. Uh, we have it today, but and I think it was proven in the Gulf War. Unfortunately, it was not there in Vietnam or Korea. They called those the forgotten veterans, and they said it was a police action. But if it was a police action. A hell of a lot of guys died. In the <laughs> was uh, so basic training went fairly well for you. Basic training was really good for me. I shed a few more pounds, and I kept a weight of 135 pounds. I dropped down to 135 pounds, and I kept that weight almost. Uh, until I started to advance in the higher grades. But when I finally got out of the Army, both active and reserve, I weighed about 155 pounds. Mm -hmm. And you see what happens. <laughs> you get a little bit lazy. Was, uh, how would you rate the, the training that you got in, in basic training? Excellent. Very, very good. What were they trying to do? They were trying to keep us alive. In the meantime, to use a word, you could say destroy the enemy, but the idea was free. We were told you either kill him or he kills you. You have no choice. Mm -hmm. uh, we, had, we had people which the idea of killing another man, you know, as I said, we were not an army out for blood or to kill or plunder, but we were told you have to learn it this way. So, 
the training was hard, it was good. We had a, in 15 weeks they had to get us ready for battle. Mm -hmm. So, and out of that, two weeks were on maneuvers. And it was the small units. At that time I didn't understand it, but now I do. To take a platoons and make them coordinated to a company size unit, then you gotta take four companies coordinate them to attack as a battalion, mm -hmm. it's, it's something incredible. It takes a lot of training and a lot of work. And it takes the right people to give the commands and to make sure that they know what they do. The, uh, the NCOs that you were dealing with at that point, uh, were they veterans of earlier World War II campaigns? Were they still holdovers from World War I? They were veterans uh, the older ones, I think, not in my unit. In my unit, the oldest one was the first sergeant, and he was a cavalryman from Texas. Mm -hmm. We had a few other non-commissioned officers, which were from North Carolina. Uh, we had a few from the West. We hadn't built uh, uh, the cadres yet, and so we depended on on the on this the old sergeant. And we did have a few which had been wounded in, in Vietnam, in Indochina, and on some of the islands. Some of them still carried what they called the jungle rot, but they were combat worthy, meaning mm -hmm. that rot would never go away, but it wouldn't produce, it was under control. And these are the men that trained us. So if they were a little rough, fine. Uh, Yes, you were shamed into dropping out on a 25 or 30 mile march. And, and you didn't drop out. Not so much for being ashamed, but the idea was drilled into you that if you're left behind, that's it, you stand alone over there. Mm -hmm. Though, but I found out that really overseas, that's, it didn't happen that way. At least in my units, it didn't happen that way. Somebody was wounded or somebody got tired or somebody broke a leg, we didn't leave him behind. We would go and get the person and we'd bring him with us. Now, after basic, uh, what happened to you? After basic, uh, I caught an infection from the old World War II packs. And the infection caught one of my breasts to become really badly infected. It was. Uh, it was amazing. I was sent to the hospital. Those that finished the, the, the two weeks maneuvers were shipped immediately overseas because we finished at the end of May. And in June, they landed uh, in Europe. Mm -hmm. I missed that by being in a hospital about two weeks, maybe a few more days, because they didn't know it, that infection, if it was necessary to do what they do today and mess, you know, take the breast out mm -hmm. or to leave it or cure it. And they decide, well, let's leave it alone, the doctor. So when I came out of there, I had to, for the, uh, they put me in with another basic unit, which uh, had one week left to go, and I went through another two weeks maneuvers. At that time, they had already landed in, uh, in Europe, and I got shipped over to the 69th Infantry Division in, in uh, Mississippi. And there was the 69th day and the 84th. Well, I found out that these divisions were training for the Pacific. And I'm deadly scared of snakes. <laughs> I didn't like the jungle either. So I said, what the hell did I do? It looks like from the pen, frying pan into the fire. Well, so, uh, that fall, and all the 69 did, it trained. And that, uh, that's where we also had the Japanese regiment, the Nissans. Mm -hmm. And they were, and they, they used to beat us on everything. Came to march, they would beat us. Unbelievable. Those little guys, about my size, could out march us with gas masks on. They would march in that 90 or 110 degree heat down there, and the, the, 
they were born for it. I don't know if they were born for it. But they put us to shame more than once. And they did go to Europe. With us, we all of a sudden didn't know. We reported to New York, Camp Kilmer. And from there, we were put on the boats. I was lucky. I got to visit my parents for a couple of days. Mm -hmm. And everybody got a few days in New York City. Then we, we put on the ships. And what happened was, we were supposed to reinforce Montgomery's unit that they wanted to invade Holland. Right. Well, the, the Red Devil, the British Red Devils, or the Red Berets, the top paratroop units, were supposed to take the canals in Holland. Apparently, they even made a movie of that later, John Wayne and a few of the others. What happened is they found, the Germans found out where they were going to drop. Well, they annihilated the British brigade, and they didn't know what to do. Here there were two divisions, so they put us took up off the ship and they put us down into uh, England and we stayed there until Christmas when the Germans then uh, pushed uh, the Bulger battle and half of our unit after the Christmas dinner where the whole company was called out and they said they went one, two, one, two and I forgot which number it was they stepped forward. Those who stepped forward were immediately taken in for reinforcement to help plug the holes in the bulge. Mm -hmm. Well, within three or four days, and those that survived were all back in England. They were wounded or shot. Again, I was lucky over there. We didn't join, uh, we didn't go to Europe until uh, about the 15th of January. Then the whole 69 division was shipped over to Europe. And uh, we were part of, a, of the, the first of the first army, and then we changed armies again. We were part of Patton and helped them build them some roads. Then we kept changing. Then we reverted to sort of a mop up division. We would clear the towns. Now, were you trained as an infantryman? We were, I was trained as an infantryman. Okay. I was a PFC then, and uh, everybody longed to get infantry badge, the infantry combat badge. Well, eventually everybody got it in there. And the reason we got the combat infantry badge is because it meant $10 more a month. When you were only getting 50, $10 more a month, that means a lot of money. So we went for the $10 more a month. And uh, we policed up Aachen. What was that like? It was a, a town which had just about been blown to bits. There was hardly anything left. Mm -hmm. A few houses, mostly mm -hmm. walls. And there were a few straggled Germans in there. And the other thing, it's very funny. You really don't see what you're shooting at. You, you know where you have an area, you fire into it. You really don't see like the movies show you that you're constantly shooting or killing mm -hmm. somebody. At least it didn't happen in our unit. We did police it up. We got some uh, <coughs> prisoners which they gave up because they were left behind. Uh, that took us about a week or ten days. We cleaned that up. What were the German prisoners like? Well, the German prisons were uh, they were a little bit surprised that they had been defeated. They had had constant victories until just now. Mm -hmm. And they were surprised that the Americans uh, could fight as well as they did. There was a great deal of respect between the Germans and the American forces. And there was a lot of comradeship between us and the British. So you got along pretty well we with the British? We got pretty good. We got pretty, very well with the British. We got along. With, with the British. And the only thing that, that's the funny part about it, well, in England, we didn't get along too well with them because the British girls liked the Americans and uh, 
everyone had a dream perhaps of coming back as a bride. The men, the British men hated us in England, the soldiers, because they said, uh, there was a slogan that they said, well, you're overpaid, you're oversexed, and you're, and you're over here. <laughs> so, uh, but we got along good with them in the, in the combat zone. So. Then the, the armies uh, became either British, French, or American. Mm -hmm. Polish units were, we never had any Polish units. And it was uh, when we got across the Rhine, when we got our first uh, what we at that time Afro-American or black units, but at that time there was no integration. Mm -hmm. We got a black platoon attached to us. Oh really? And uh, it was amazing that we did get along very well, and very well. As I think in combat you don't look at colors or anything. You watch my back, I watch your back. It was an infantry platoon? It was an infantry platoon. And it was integrated into company. the company? It was, it was integrated to the company. How did the company officers deal with it? Very good. They had their own, uh, they had their own office. There was a black office there. And they had a black sergeants. And, uh, they, did a, they did their job. They were infantry. And they tied in very nicely in with us and coordinating whatever we had the defense or patrols or why uh, or any of the other chores. But they didn't mix until after the war. Now during the Korean War, down at Fort Lee, Virginia, when we trained, then we began to integrate the black troops with the white troops. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I saw them. But now we're talking about service company, and we're talking about four years later. Uh, they got along good, uh, even in the schools that I that I was selected for to go. Once you're selected on a career track, they select you for schools which you attend. And that was good. There was the competition was good, but it was good clean competition. Who became number one? Who became number two? Uh, we had some West Point officers which had to do some catching up, cadets rather than our officers. They were training with us. I think they picked more on the cadets than they picked on the Air Force troops because they knew they were going to be officers later on. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we had already passed that stage. And when I got my commission in 1950, then I met my wife, and we were married, and that career broke out, and we ended up back down in Fort Lee, where I became an instructor as well as uh, a student. There was a combination of, of let's, that. Let's uh, just back up to, um, let's see, you crossed the Rhine, do you remember where? What do you mean you crossed the Rhine? Wait, Rhine, when you crossed the oh, Rhine. Oh, you crossed the Rhine. We crossed the Rhine, uh, which was a, was a mistake, the bridge which the German was supposed to blow, they didn't get a chance to blow it. Well, that bridge was very well protected from then on. I mean, we got so many divisions, I think the whole first army rolled right across. Is this uh, the bridge at Ramagan? The bridge at Ramagan, that's correct. Okay. When we got there, it had been reinforced and pontoon bridges had been established some of the other bridges had been repaired where you could get uh, men across or one truck at a time across. So we got across that bridge and there was a sight to see on it, unbelievable, this old bridge. But it had been reinforced unbelievably to take all that weight that constantly went across it. I don't know if, if anybody ever came back, I think all that dude kept pushing. <laughs> well, it eventually collapsed. Oh yes, that was from the constant use of it. They couldn't take that. But by that time, we had other bridges built our own the pontoon bridge. So once across the Rhine, uh, what was your? We what were, you be, what were you doing? We were the, uh, two of our regiments were in combat. Our regiments was in reserve, and uh, we took Leipzig 
not Leipzig, we took Kassel first. Kassel then had to be cleared up because the idea is you sweep through it, you take it, and then Kassel came on, uh, had to be cleared up. There was a large city. I don't know how many people are there today, I would say it's close to about a million. But it was a large city even then. So that took us a while to clean it up. And we took a lot of Germans prison there, which were trapped in the houses. But by this time, it was April. And uh, they could sense that the war was coming to an end. And they were more worried about the Russians, as they had begun to in Poland and begin to enter Germany. Mm -hmm. They really did not want to fight the Americans anymore. I think General Patton was right. To, he said if we wanted to, we could have walked into Germany. Because the next largest city that we took, we were supposed to have had a big battle there. There was supposed to have been a whole battalion facing our regiment and our battalion was a whole battalion. Uh, battalion of 88s. And unfortunately, these 88s, there were very few men in it. It was mostly women that were going to do the fighting. Uh, but there was no hard in fighting. Of course, we didn't know that. And we were getting ready for the attack, and they were looking down on us. And we figured we were going to take a beat there from what we were told. So most of the men are not told that much. But by nightfall, they surrendered. So. We, with a few sporadic battles, they took Leipzig, we took Leipzig. And Leipzig, of course, is the city music of Germany. Mm -hmm. That was a large city. It was destroyed by Air Barbatum as well as uh, by uh, artillery fire. But we captured a lot of Germans where, in one point, the, a whole battalion of Germans surrendered to us, and they told that the heart was not in fighting mm -hmm. Americans anymore. They were concerned more what would happen to their families and so forth with the Russians on the other side mm -hmm. coming on it. And we sat around Leipzig, I would say about three, maybe four weeks. We didn't move, we didn't do anything. Uh, we did get the brewery going, so we distribute beer to everybody in the air. That was the first thing <laughs> that we did. I'm sure we did other things, like bring electricity back to the people. So we but you remember the beer. Oh, well, everybody remembers the beer. And the ice cream. Oh. We got an ice cream plant fixed. Uh, they, uh, But we stayed over there. And I think that's... That's how I became more interested in the food. I had found myself one of these three-wheeled trucks that run on charcoal. And I was having a hell of a time. I fired this little truck up, and I was running all over the place with it, except going downhill at one time. I said to her, I tried to stop it. There were no brakes on it. I said, oh, well, I didn't stop this. <laughs> and I didn't want to, I said, I don't want to get myself hurt on this. So I figured if I run it against the wall, it should automatically stop without the brakes on it. Well, I did run against the wall, except that the first wheel, the front wheel got stuck and smacked. I fell off. I broke a couple of ribs. And at that time, you didn't go to the hospital for anything so silly. And so the doctor patched me up. He says, now nah, you're not sick enough to go to the hospital, and, but you're too sick to be in go back to the squad and so we'll put you in the kitchen for a while. That's how I got involved into the kitchen. And uh, the same thing that happened back in the state. Excuse me, just a second, we need to change. The cooks over there one day. They had sheep over there. And nobody could cut a sheep in their mess hall. I was on KP. So I told the sergeant, he says, I says, you know, I can cut that sheet up for you. He says, well, you're a butcher. I says, no, I'm not a professional butcher. I says, but I've killed animals. I watched my father do it, and I helped him do it, which was a lie, a white lie. <laughs> so I, well, what's there to cutting up a sheep? I figured if you move the muscle, or the muscle with the joint is, that's where you would cut. 
<laughs> then of course the bone comes out, so there's all the meat. <laughs> so that's how I ended up helping in the mess hall in the state. Mm -hmm. Then I got thrown back in the infantry when we got overseas. So it was a combination back. Here they had, we had captured German food. And there was these giant pigs, half pigs. Well, nobody knew how to cut up that half a pig. So I said, well, there's a good chance to be new. So I said, I can't, I can't cut that up. I'm a butcher. I said, oh, you are? I said, well, I did the same thing. Well, I cut up that. So I became the butch for the company for a while. <laughs> and that's how my career in the food business started. Well, the war was over after that. We were, our division met the Russians while we were sitting over there. One of the, one of the patrols strayed by mistake beyond where they were not supposed to go. Our division was not supposed to be the one to meet the Russian. I think it had been set up with the fanfare. Everything's sort of set up like a show. And, uh, well, all of a sudden, everything was blaring. The 69th Infantry made, meets the Russian divisions over here. Of course, the generals and everything, you know, hey, we're not going to let this opportunity pass up, just like Montgomery, and I learned later on that the commander of General Staffkoff, Montgomery and Patton didn't like each other for hell of high war. <laughs> so, our general, he grabbed the, he wasn't going to let the other general, his patrol died, so he rushed over to meet the Russian generals. <laughs> Who was the division commander? Do you remember? Uh, general Baldy. Because I remember that because when I went, we were known as the three Bs, Baldy's, Bidwack, and Bastards. That's what they called. He kept us up in the field. The only time we came in off the field, was to take a shower, change clothes, repack our packs, and then move out again. He constantly kept us in the field, which was good. We, we were well trained and we were in good physical shape. I mean, things that I could do then is unbelievable. Whether we had to walk three miles or we had to do 30 miles, we could do it. So uh, VE Day comes. He day comes over there and we met the Russians over there. The Russians were happy, the Americans were happy, and uh, we finally made friends with some of the Russian troops. They came over to our side, we went over there, and uh, later on we were told not to go over there so much, be friendly with them, but don't go there. The Russian troops were very nice, no different than us. They were, they were very friendly, they had been to a ter terrible war. The, the ones which uh, I never saw any, they had the Manchurian troops. I understand that the last minute Stalin brought in a lot of, formed a lot of divisions from Manchuria. Mm -hmm. They were a very rough type of a troop on it. They were friendly, but they were very, you could say they were like the old guard on it. Their job was to eliminate the enemy. Mm -hmm. And uh, never met any of them. The German people were afraid of the Russians, what they had heard of them or what they had done. And uh, we stayed in this situation. You stay on your half, we stayed on our half while we were friends and we traded cigarettes and back and forth. They had nothing to trade. They were amazed at the American army. And the Russian forces also had Russian combat women with them, right in the infantry units. Mm. What do um, you think of that? Well, it's amazing to see them. They were not the ones that uh, that you would read. They were not so-called the American work. They, they were infantry, they were infantry combat clothes. They were very heavy, very muscular. I imagine the good ones, they had the good ones too, but you didn't see them in the combat units. And they loved to drink, but they loved to party too. I'm not much into that, so it didn't face me. But as I said, we were told, 
yes, be friendly with them, but try not to get too involved. Mm -hmm. They, of course, if they would see a German woman or something, they would go out of their way to grab her. Americans are not that type. They're more the protective type. And I think that's what our commanders were trying to avoid. Mm -hmm. Some sort of a clash over uh, old women or personality or so forth. Mm -hmm. Besides, when one side drinks and the other one drinks, you can get into a hell of a mess. We did see a fight once between an American and a Russian, but they were stopped about who was the better soldier. And they each pulled a knife, but we jumped in and we stopped that. So then we did stay away from them. Then the order came down, because what had been agreed with the big four, we turned half of Germany over to them. And when that was found out, there was a mass exodus of Germans. Uh, they joined the American army in leaving that part of Germany. Mm. And they all moved to West Germany, what became known as West Germany, in which provided some problems for us. You know, how do you care for these people now? Mm -hmm. Germany had nothing. But they did the job. The American military government did a hell of a job. In, in how long were you in uh, occupied Germany? In the occupied Germany, the war ended in 45. I didn't come back here until May 46. Occupation was, uh, I would say, a little over a year. I got there in uh, 1945 in England. We landed in January in Europe, 46. And, uh, I didn't leave there until uh, almost the end of 40. No, 45, we left it over there in France, then we became, then I came back over here. May 46, we returned there. About 18 months in Europe. So uh, you had decided to become a career soldier at this point? I decided to become a career. I, have what, I enlisted in the reserve, then I went back to college because. Uh, it helped pay for me the GI Bill, and uh, the reserve at that time wasn't getting paid. At the beginning, was was four. Of course, I led the infantry again. That's all I knew. And uh, I went to the ROTC at City College, and uh, the Colonel down there says, "Well, you're a sergeant." Now. I said, "You don't have to go through basic." He said that you'll get your commission as soon as you finish your two semesters of advanced ROTC. Mm -hmm. So I had my commission within one year as a second lieutenant. The others had to go through the four-year ROTC program. I started college there, but I didn't get my bachelor's degree until 1950. Because no. I was going at night. Why did you decide to make the Army your career? I liked it because uh, I found it very exciting and I found that that's where you could really be what you wanted. As long as you kept your nose clean, I like taking orders. I'm what you call an order take, and I like giving orders. I don't like people telling me what to do. And I will do what I'm told to do, as long as I can pass it on to someone else. <laughs> but I did like it, and uh, I felt, it may sound clever, but I felt I owe this country a great deal. And my father gave up a lot. He came over here with only $500 in his family. There was me, my brother, my sister, and my mother. There were six other, five brothers and one more sister, six more, but they all died because of uh, lack of medical service. While my father was in service in World War I, mm -hmm. uh, she was left alone as a bride in Europe with these small children. There was no medicine in Europe, there was mm -hmm. none of that, so they, they passed away when he came back. He was very sad about it. 
So this country gave me a chance to be what I really wanted to be. And uh, I wanted to be really a chemical engineer as well as an officer. And I could see what the American Army had done, and I could see the pride, and I enjoyed wearing the uniform of the special uniform. Because my wife loved the Army too. Because if you don't have a, to me, I tell everybody, if your wife is not willing to support your Army career, I don't think you can succeed in it. Mm -hmm. Because there were times when I would go to school, or I would go on some a special you know, if I could grab a, a small assignment, a small duty, I would go there. She wouldn't, have, she wouldn't stop me. Otherwise, someone, someone, someone else would say, well, oh, what are you taking off again? Where are you going? And she enjoyed the Army life, too. Mm -hmm. She used to pack up the kids as soon as we used to be someplace. Right down there, she'd be with the kids. Mm -hmm. They'd have a ball with it. And I do owe my education and everything that I got to the Army. There's no two ways about it. I completed a tremendous amount of school and in the Army. I think I had already finished all the school and when it came time for the Commander in General Staff College, I think I was the only captain ever admitted to the Commander in General Staff College. Mm. And when they said, well, at that time they only took majors or lieutenant colonels. Today I think it's only lieutenant colonels. But I had completed all the other courses. Mm -hmm. So uh, they said, well, send them. So I went, I went to the Commander General Staff College. Then later on, I went over there again. And uh, in between, I used, to, I used to teach the Reserve Commander General Staff classes. I used to teach them around Albany here. As I said, uh, through them, I was able to finish all those schools. They are the top when it comes to teaching management mm -hmm. and how to control men, how to get them to do things. I don't think there is any other place that you can you can teach that. Once you have the actual experience of working with the men and women, what um, what did you do when Korea started? Well. I was married one week and Korea broke out, so we went down to Fort Lee, Virginia. I got to take a special course down there, and uh, I asked, could I go? said yes, my wife, we uh, were just married. So on and off in there, we spent about almost three years, all in the States, down to Fort Lee, going back and, and forth, and that's where I ended up uh, finishing all these courses <coughs> and also doing some teaching mm -hmm. to the Army. Mm -hmm. But that, we were sort of lucky. Well, they were in Korea. I never was picked for Korea, mm -hmm. didn't go to Korea. Mm -hmm. Then when the Berlin call, call up came, I got called in on that. Now, were you I had volunteered for Vietnam, but they didn't want me at that time for whatever reason. Now, know. when Korea started, you were in the reserves? I was in the reserves. Okay. And uh, down at Fort Lee, there were a lot of reserve officers. There were active duty officers, and that's where also a lot of cadets officers were sent down. When I was down there, I was... Uh, we were working with, with the Turkish, some Turkish army office. We had some officers from South America, and we had officers from Thailand. I got attached to the Thailand group, sort of tutoring them. And they were very nice, and later on to, to the Turkish troops. But we had to change. And it was just to explain them ideas. I remember the general in charge of the Thailand uh, group, he said to me, what are we wasting time with this? Because we were teaching them how to do laundry, how to do ice cream, uh, 
how to give showers to the troops. And they have to go through all these units. Mm -hmm. He says, I don't want my men to learn this. I said, well, that's part of the regular program, which has been established. He says, no, 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 no. He says, we don't want that. He said, our men don't need ice cream. Our men don't need to take a laundry. They got to wash their washing the streams. <laughs> he says, I want you to tell your people my men must know how to kill the enemy. That's what we want to know. We don't want none of this, right? He says, that is why the American army is so big. You people make ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> There's a little cultural difference. Uh, here. Quite a bit, quite a bit. And they were very nice. They gave some nice little gifts to their wives to have over there. Mm -hmm. And my wife got a, we were invited several times to have dinners. They eat different from the Americans. The wives do all the cooking, but they stay to one side. The men eat, and the wife serves. Then after the men for the sheep, the wives eat. <laughs> when did the uh, different today? Yes, quite a bit. When did you finally uh, leave active duty? I between active and reserve. I think I finally got out in '76. And then I just stayed active by staying in these, what they call, low test units. Going in, if they needed a, if they needed an observer, if they needed a, someone to do a, a study, mm -hmm. or sometimes to check out a unit, I would go for them. There used to be the low test units on it. Mm -hmm. Most of the time I did, I went with Division. Then I stayed. Uh, I stayed together. There was a group of officers which were selected to, <clears throat> in case there was a, an emergency. But supposedly, and I was never involved with it. Uh, supposedly, the president could call these people in. I guess the president can call any unit in. But there were selected offs, I was one of them, that, you know, if we need you, well, you get the phone call mm -hmm. and you would go to this unit and so on. And you would report there for duty. And you had the letter mobilization in your pocket, all you would need is the phone call, and you would show the letter to any airfield, civilian or otherwise, and they would fly you to your destination where you were supposed to report. Of course, you didn't carry the letter, which I don't know. So I was finally released from that. I never got a call on that or anything. I was finally released from that after the war in the Persian Gulf and the week after that, the war ended and then a month later, they finally released me and I think they released a group of these officers. They said, that we don't need you, but you are still in the file in case there is an emergency. How much had the Army changed from 1944 to when you uh, finally got out? Oh, unbelievable. What a change there was. Good changes? All Bad good. changes? No, good. There are good changes because the men now have a tremendous ability to learn what we can learn. They now they can actually learn if they want to, and if they want to make a career, I don't think you can find a better school. They uh, let's start with the basic: the food and the clothing, the living condition. Basic now is nine weeks. I realize it's uh, it's peacetime. However, what you learn today. You got to have a knowledge of computers. You got to have a knowledge of electronics. What you can learn today in the army or the air force or the navy is unbelievable. What they teach you, it is unbelievable on it. The pay, yes, it still is not what it should be comparable to the others. But how many of these young people don't even come close to making it? No. 
my grandson, he had a good chance to go to West Point or the Air Force Academy. Sadly to say, someone very close to him talked him out of it. Now, he finished uh, the University of Hartford and he, uh, he's taken law in Albany and he wants to go now to Judge Advocates Department. So he took the first physical and he failed it because he was still a certain amount of fat around the neck and the stomach. So he's going to go back at the end of August. But if it is for him, and he finally realizes, he said, you know, Grandpa, I wish I had taken you up on that then, because now I know what you meant. It's not only the chance that he, he finally figured out that he likes it from what he's seen, but the opportunity to practice law, that there is so many different laws that they, they can practice in the service now. Plus, I told him about the opportunities and the connections that you can make as you work in the different areas. I said, and you know, you only have to give 18 years. You can stay longer in the reserve. So he's definitely interested in that, so I'm hoping he makes it. I bring that out as an example. The young people today, they don't know what a missile When it's missiles, rockets, mm -hmm. Aeronautical, you can't beat the aeronautical train that they give you. I inspected a helicopter unit about 12 years ago in Alabama, the helicopter school, and I couldn't believe it. I had all these young people over there, and I said, how in God's name are you going to be able to teach these people to take these helicopters apart? He says, we don't teach them to take them apart. He said, Colonel, what we do now is they got the book that they are taking a test, and the test is by it's an open book test. Is this something wrong with the helicopter? They are hooked up just like when you bring in your car, you hook it up. You find the part that's wrong, those parts are mobile, you take the parts out. We replace that part, but we gotta know the exact part to take out. That's what these people are learning here. Take out the wrong part that we haven't corrected the problem. And the part that is damaged goes back, what they call third echelon, where they do the major repair, if necessary, even to the manufacturer. How would you uh, generally categorize your military experience? Kind of sort of summing it up. Summing it up? If I had to do it all over again, I would do it. I don't really love it. I owe the Army, and of course this country is the Army, a great deal. I owe them my education, and I think I owe them my success, and the ability to tell people what to do it and how to do it. So Very good. You can, be, you can run hot or cold for them. If I had it my way, I think we would have less problem in this country if every person who finishes high school, I would like to see them do 18 months in a choice of service of their choice. I think they will learn not only a job, they will learn what it is to get along with their fellow people, they will learn comradeship, but they will learn respect. And they will know what it is. I don't think too many people understand the kind of country we live in. And freedom is so fragile at this time that it's unbelievable how it can be so easily lost. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. You did a